it's really a gift and a privilege because um, being here, not only with myself, but on behalf of really courageous defenders everywhere who believe that it is possible to end torture as an investigative tool and implement due process rights in our lifetime. Um, they've often said to me, as they're working really courageously in their countries, but are there really people everywhere who support what we do? And um, there's a poem by Albert Schweitzer, which is from Switzerland, so I can begin with. There's a poem that says, at times our own light goes out, and we all have reason and pause to give thanks to those who have rekindled the flame within. And you being here today rekindles the flame within for all of the defenders. So I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, International Bridges of Justice is committed to the notion that it is possible for us to end torture as an investigative tool and implement due process rights in the 93 countries and of the 113 countries today where laws have been passed. There are of the 113 countries today that still torture. 93 of these countries actually have passed laws that say you have a right to a lawyer, a right not to be tortured. So in the 93 countries, International Bridges to Justice believes that it is possible for us to place trained lawyers in, at an early stage in courtrooms as well as police stations in order to move this process forward. So I wanted to start with how this all began. And for me, it began as I was also um, writing letters with Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And in 1994, I walked into a prison in Cambodia. And at the prison, I came face to face with a 12-year-old boy who had been tortured and denied access to counsel. And as I looked into the eyes of this young boy, what I realized is that for all of the hundreds of letters myself and my colleagues had written for important political prisoners everywhere, we would never have written a letter for this 12-year-old boy precisely because he was not an important political prisoner who had done anything for anyone. He was, in fact, a 12-year-old boy who had stolen a bicycle. Now, the irony of the situation is that the Cambodian government, like so many governments, like the other 93 governments in the world, said, you know what, if you want to come in and help him, precisely because he hasn't done anything good for anybody, because he isn't a political prisoner, go right ahead. But I realized that there was a gap in the system because the world was focused on saving the 5% of important political prisoners Whereas in reality, 95% of the people being tortured today are not political prisoners. They are just people who are caught in the midst of a broke down, broken down legal system. And as I looked at it, I realized that 25 years ago when I was in college, we were looking at closed communist systems, authoritarian governments, dictatorships. And in many ways, there was precious little you could do. You could write a letter. You could do certain things. But we didn't actually have the systems in place. And within the last decade, in so many of these countries, all the laws have been passed. But the issue is that torture continues in large part because it is unfortunately the cheapest form of investigation. It's much cheaper to torture someone to get a confession than it is to actually build the legal system where you have early access to counsel, which ensures the fact that people are protected. So a number of years ago, encountering this young boy, beginning to work in Cambodia, um, and realizing that this issue was worldwide, I began to think about starting something which gave us a sense of, of moving forward positively in the future. And it was in part spurred by one of the experiences I had um, while working in an orphanage in Cambodia. And I remember there was a, a fantastic sister, her name is Sister Rose, and she worked at this orphanage called Missionaries of Charity. And I remember being a little bit, you know, Sunday was my great day because I always went to the orphanage and would talk with Sister Rose. And on one particular day, I was feeling a little bit disheartened by the situation. And I said, you know, what can we really do? I mean, how do we know that we're going to be able to transform the situation? And I remember that she gave me one piece of advice, which, um, which I've held with me and I've seen it transform. And she said, you know, you have to remember, Karen, that whatever you're doing, whether you're working with prison guards who are torturing people or judges or prosecutors or whoever, that um, you must find and work with the Christ or the Buddha in each person. Because she really believed in the power of transformative love and that it wasn't only by protesting against people or just telling people that they were doing the wrong thing, but actually saying, let's sit, let's stand side by side, let's walk together, let's see what we can do that we could make a difference. 
So I began this organization with the hope and the belief that it was possible for us to actually work with these 93 countries and say, what is the light? What is the possibility? And at the same time that I was speaking with Sister Rose, I also had a, a Buddhist meditation um, friend who said to me, and you must remember that whatever you focus upon will grow. And I want to tell you today that there are phenomenally courageous defenders throughout the world. And they're not human rights defenders, they're actually criminal defense lawyers who are just trying to implement systems and trying to do their jobs, who have had incredible changes in the way that they started work, in the way that they've been working. So in the year 2000, I first went into China. And as I went into China, I, um, I and you probably have seen it too, there are often, have, have, there are often um, there were often newspaper articles even about Chinese lawyers and the newspaper articles even the New York Times said things like You know lawyers are becoming the embodiment of what they're fighting for meaning that there are laws on the books But literally at the end of the court trial a judge or a prosecutor may point to the lawyer and say you have obstructed justice or the lawyers handcuffed bring them to jail beat them until they're bloody and take a videotaped confession of them and so I met with a number of the lawyers on the grounds, and the lawyers said, you know, it is true that there are issues here, but we believe that we can move forward positively if we find ways of working together with the government. So I went and I met with the Ministry of Justice in China, and to everyone's surprise, the Chinese government said, yes, these are our laws. Um, we would like support in implementing them. And so I signed an MOU with them and they said, listen, help us implement our own domestic laws that are consistent with human rights. So one of the first things we did is we met together with the lawyers and the lawyers said, hey, you know, one of the problems is that if you walk into prisons, you walk into the prosecutor's office, you'll see huge signs that say, resist punishment, confess better treatment. And we should do something about this. Even if we started an advisement or rights campaign, it would make a difference in terms of the consciousness. Um, so the lawyers put together a new poster. We got the stamp of approval from the Chinese government, and the new poster said instead, you have a right to a lawyer. You have a right not to be tortured. So in the ensuing campaigns, we had members of every legal aid center, 3,000 across the nation. We had actually 3,000 again, but 3,000 members of the Youth Communist League who said, hey, we can do this. We will come together and we will sit down with police officers. We will sit side by side and see how we can transform the situation. So slowly, by building model centers in China, by working together with the government, we have seen transformation that has begun step by step, piece by piece. Now the interesting thing is that once we started in China, for reasons completely unknown to me, we started receiving requests from almost virtually every corner of the world, from Burundi, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, India, Cambodia, everywhere, everywhere, places that I had never even heard of. Well, I'd heard of them, but I had never been there. They said, we have the exact same issue. We have laws that are on the books, but we are not sure. We need support in actually implementing them. And the beginning thought was, well, you know, maybe these countries are really different, but they're saying that there's a commonality. There's a culture. There's something that's, that's the same. And I thought, you know, we can't say no. We can't say, that's great, you have this idea, but we can't help you. So we started looking into ways that we could even begin to support them. And what I found is that I went to Burundi, and it was almost like a deja vu, because in Cambodia, I'd been in Cambodia 10 years earlier, and you know, when I walked into prison, I saw the 12-year-old boy, I met a woman who had been um, in prison for 10 years, and she said, my husband committed a crime 10 years ago, but they can't find him, so here I am. And you know, this was just a normal thing. So I didn't find a 12-year-old boy, and I did not find a, a woman who had been in prison for 10 years, but instead I saw an eight-year-old boy who was there for stealing a mobile phone. Instead, I, there's tons of little babies, <laughs> picked up one of the really cute babies, and I said to the mother, you know, your baby is really cute. Wasn't a baby three years old? And she said, yes, yes, but she is why I'm here. And she tells me that she was um, imprisoned, and she's been imprisoned for the last two years for stealing two diapers and an iron for her child. She said, you know, I was, stole the two diapers, but I returned the iron. And um, so we see that throughout the countries there were similarities, and the issue was really about rebuilding a system that could work. Now in Burundi, like many other countries, what we've done in the last few years is we have built, put together the first legal aid center, and at the same time, we've managed to do roundtable discussions which have deeply influenced the government. And only a few months ago, the president himself issued a directive that freed 3,000 people like this woman 
who were there for unjust reasons. So slowly we do see that progress is happening and it is possible. Um, and at the same time, we realize, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a vision, you say, okay, you know, it is absolutely possible to end torture as an investigative tool if we decide to. There's two things. First of all, people always say that's a nice idea, but absolutely, you know, kind of crackpot, wildly idealistic, and never gonna happen. And the only reason that we sometimes feel happy when people use exactly those words is because we realize that the exact same thing was said when people in the United States said, oh, we're gonna end slavery, or they looked at South Africa and said, we need to end apartheid, meaning the conditions are there. But what it takes is it takes an absolute commitment on our part to implementing the laws and actually making it happen. Now, you could have a great idea, but it's always also about a credible strategy. Do you have a credible strategy that will make this work? And what we've realized is that it isn't only, I mean, the power, we believe, of our idea and our hope isn't only that there's a credible strategy, but it is really about the absolute resourcefulness and belief of the people on the ground. And I'll give you an example. One is that um, I was in Zimbabwe with one of our defenders. And I remember that we walked into a prison. And I've been in a lot of prisons, so not all of them are shocking. But this one was really, really shocking walked into the prison, and I, had, I already knew that it was a difficult situation because our defender on the ground had said five of our clients have died this month because of the prison conditions. And as soon as I walked in, they said to me, you know, it's problematic. We're only able to feed the prisoners once a day, not a very good meal, and every day because there's not enough food, we have to choose 30% of the prisoners not to feed. So I said, oh, that's not very good. <laughs> but as we walked in, um, there was like a sea of faces. There was just a very crammed small area, and they said, oh, this is better, because at night it's really cramped, but during the day there's more space. But literally, it was like, they were so, 200 people so crammed together that you only had walking room. Like, the only way they could move is if they walked together. And I remember standing there, and we came with our defenders, and I said, um, how many of you are here for pretrial detention? Meaning you, you, you haven't yet had a trial. And one guy said, stood up and said two years, another guy said five years, another guy said eight years. And I turned to our defender and I said, you know, did I, did I say that correctly? Because I meant pre-trial detention, not people who have already been convicted. And he said, yeah, pre-trial detention. Now, what I thought was amazing about it were two things. One is that even though these people were in such an intense situation that seemed really hopeless, as each person stood up, every person clapped for his or her um, comrade. And, and I thought it was an amazing show of even in the most difficult situation, they found ways of finding hope and bringing it forward. And at the end, they sang me a song, and they said, listen, we have some hope, because we know that there is some support somewhere coming through. And um, as I walked out, I talked to the defenders. We only had two defenders, and we hadn't even really begun our legal aid support there. And I said, well, you know, we don't have a lot of resources. How are you guys going to do it? And <laughs> um, Innocent Maja, who I wish, I wish was here today, because he's unbelievable, says to me, we will find a way to make the resources that we have be the resources that we need. And I saw him stand up, and we had a gathering of, of lawyers. There's only one legal aid, but he gathered lawyers throughout the country who are criminal defense lawyers, tried to find a way of putting them into a criminal defense corps. And he said, I have heard it said that we cannot help all of these people who are in need because we lack resources. He said, but I want you to know today that the lack of resources is never an excuse. And we must move forward, and we must proceed in faith. And I was moved by it because I thought, gee, I feel a little hopeless right now, but how are you going to do it? And what I've seen over and over and over for the defenders on the ground is that they are courageous, and they believe, and they're finding ways of moving forward despite whatever the circumstances are. And at the same time, um, we as a world community need to move forward. We as a world community need to find a way to actively support these defenders in the most amazing ways forward. And, you know, I had come back recently from a trip in India where four people are tortured to death every day. 
hundreds are tortured, but four actually die. It's a country where the government and the officials and the Supreme Court have been incredibly open towards our help and have said, come in if you can and support us in providing training and setting up public defender systems that would ensure early access to counsel. They had come back and seen a number of our clients who had been tortured because we hadn't been able to provide access at an early stage. And I was myself feeling a little bit like, hmm, you know, how do we move this forward? Is it really possible that we can work country by country? And I remember I came back from India and I was on a Skype call with our fellow from Cambodia. And three years ago, we hired a Cambodian fellow. Now, he's an interesting person because he actually was a police officer who used to be involved in investigative torture and now, as a lawyer, is turning his country around. And when I hired him three years ago, I remember during the interview, I said to him, you know, can you promise me that before you die, he's in his 50s, so he's a lot of time, <laughs> I said, before you die, there's 21 provinces in Cambodia that you will systematically set up early access to counsel for every man, every woman, and every child by placing a legal aid center in every province and ensuring that there's no torture. So anyway, I remember he looked down and he thought about it. And then he looked up and he said to me, Karen? I said, yes, I cannot. <laughs> he said, oh. well, anyway, you're hired. Because <laughs> he was a phenomenal man. Um, I said, just try your best. Anyway, just come back from India. And this is just um, a number of months ago. And he called me and he said, listen, I want to tell you something. He said, in the three provinces where we have set up legal aid, because we set up three legal aid offices, the judge is assigning early access to counsel for every man, every woman, every child. And in those three provinces, torture is virtually eliminated. He says, and because of that, the government has come to me and asked me to work together with them to set up a comprehensive plan countrywide for the 21 provinces. He says, so I want to tell you that before I die, I know I can. So I want to end with, in my last minute, <laughs> um, asking that all of us work together and believing that we can because there are phenomenally courageous people on the ground, but they need you to believe too, and they need you to take whatever action you can. And I'll end with Vishnu in 47 seconds, my favorite person in Cambodia who always inspired me because he said, um, he was four years old when I met him. He was born in a Cambodian prison um, with like no material goods or anything. But I remember that because he was small, the guards would let him in and out of the prison. Um, in and out of the bars, meaning he used to crawl in and out. By the time I met him, his head was bigger, so he couldn't easily go through. But he would go through the first bar, the second bar, the third bar, slowly turn his head and come down. He would grab my pinky because he wanted to have me bring him to the 154 prisoners in Kandal prison so he could put his fingers through and say hello. And for most of these prisoners, he was like their greatest sunshine and their greatest hope. And I always remember, he must have thought to himself, I'm one, I'm only one, but I can do something, and I'll do the thing that I can do. So I ask you today to join International Bridges of Justice, but also Vishna in this journey of ending torture as an investigative tool and implementing due process in our lifetime. Thank you.